good morning, New Walk. Will you guys stand to your feet? Do me a favor, greet your neighbor, welcome them as well, and then let's get ready to worship. Come out of the dark, just as you 
We're going to sing a song that we have, quite frankly, we've worn out. We sing it all the time. It's a song called Waymaker. I know you guys love it. But as we, as we go into this song, when we hear the words, we're calling out to God. We're calling him all these things. You are a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. As we go into this, this song, I want us to focus on which one of those things do we need God to be for us today? Are you here because you need a miracle worker? Do we need to light the darkness today? Let's sing this out. Come on. You are here, moving in an army, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place, I worship you. Stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never. 
Church, will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you are all these things. We thank you that you are the light in the darkness, that you are a way maker. You are a promise keeper. God, as we go into this time of worship and hearing Pastor Gary's message, Lord, we ask that you would just lift him up, God. We lift him up. And we ask that you would give him wisdom, that you would give him the words to say. And Lord, we pray that you would penetrate the hardest of hearts this weekend as we dive into this new series about hurts and healing. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing in this community and in this church. We thank you for the cross. And we thank you for Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray. All right, amen. You guys do me a favor before you sit down, scoot in, scoot in, make room for others that are still kind of creeping in. Amen. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming out to be with us here this morning. We're glad you took time out of your day to be with us because we are kicking off a new series and you picked a great week to be a part of New Walk because this series is going to be a powerful series and there's going to be some stuff even today that is going to be needed to be dealt with. I can't wait to share with you uh, this series. Uh, of course, we have some folks that are here with us today visiting for the very first time. There are VIPs. Let's welcome our VIPs here in the house. Glad that you're here. A little message to any first-time visitor or people that call this church their home regularly. I want to say this to you, that uh, this series, and especially today, is what you might call at times a PG-13 series. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, I think our teens can handle a lot of this dialogue, but I think our younger ones that maybe ought to be in kids' ministry or at least being ministered to there, this is the right time for them to be in the kids' ministry. By the way, we have an incredible kids' ministry. I don't know if you know that. It's pretty amazing. Um, but there are some topics that we're going to be dealing with this series. There's some topics we're going to be dealing with today. And as a parent, you may not want to go home and have some splaining to do. You know what I mean? So we might uh, just have to think about that just a little bit uh, because of some of the nature of these topics. Now, also, I want to say that we have uh, uh, something happening tonight that I want to bring to your attention before I get started. We have a work that we do here at our church. It's called Young Adults. And Young Adults is um, all about connecting our kids that are out of high school 
So we, we say they're out of high school all the way up to age 29, connecting them to the church in a very intentional way. We're going to be meeting tonight. We have a once a month gathering here at 6 o'clock this, this week. It's here at the church at 6 p.m. And uh, this gathering, again, once a month to just kind of connect the kids in that age group and then, you know, help them connect more deeply in the church. I think over the years we, uh, in the church, we, we say, okay, you know, we're going to take care of you and your you're a kid, and you grow up, and you get into the student ministry, and we're still taking care of you, and then, then kind of you get out of youth ministry, and the church says, now have at it, you know, we, you just go, and sometimes maybe we need a little bridge to help them connect, and so that's what we're trying to do here with our young adult ministry. If you are in that age bracket, man, you don't have to sign up, just show up, we gather, we visit, we talk, we share, it's going to be a good night uh, tonight for that, and of course, if you know somebody that's in that age group, man, you join us, come bring somebody with you that's in that age bracket as well. And it'll be a good night to be a part of that. This series, though, is about love, relationships, our love relationships. There's in particular things that in the realm of dating or marriage relationships, especially. And so much of our talks are going to be centered around those things. And there are going to be some talks that deal with things sexual as well. As a matter of fact, today is one of those topics. And, and I'm going to share with you something in the relationship sexual realm that I have had to deal with as a pastor, and it's why I feel like we need to talk to you today, and that is this, is that I deal with so much difficulty and struggle in people's relationships as I'm helping them, and so much of it is centered around past brokenness. Uh, Some of it's around current brokenness. What I mean is, I talk to people who are struggling in their marriage, and they're struggling in their marriage because of past infidelities mistakes maybe even before they got married or things that were done to them sexual abuses that they're still trying to process and deal with and they're not healthy today uh, because of things that happened maybe in the past Uh, there are marriages and relationships that are damaged today because of current activity when it comes to sexual addictions or pornography and it's hurting and damaging the current relationship or the current marriage Uh, there are uh, infidel there are uh, there's adultery taking place or it has taken place, and people are, are struggling to continue on because of it. And so I know that, that the struggle with things outside the bounds of marriage, especially uh, uh, sexual things that, that aren't a part of God's plan today, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about sexual temptation and sin, how to deal with it, how to overcome it, God's best plan for our life when it comes to these things. I'm looking forward to share with you. And, and look, at this, this topic is, is kind of tense. It's going to reveal some things, and, and some of you are going to be dealing with some things that, that I'm talking about, some things that you don't want to talk about, quite honestly. Like, you want to keep it in the dark, you want to suppress it, you, you're squirming a little bit, you, you don't like it, it's a tense conversation that we're about to have. But it's okay, I, I don't think you came to church so that I would sugarcoat things. I think you came here because you want a pastor that's willing to, to get honest and talk about the things we need to talk about. By the way, the church has done a really bad job at talking about this stuff. You know what we kind of do? I think sometimes what we kind of do is we say, uh, this is, you know, if we're going to talk about sexual purity and sexual sin, you know what? That's for the student ministry. You know, we got to have our students. They got to learn about that stuff. But, but yet, uh, I'm not, I'm dealing with the adults and that's what I, I have to deal with this stuff. And it's permeating our adult culture, our communities, our families, our marriages. And so I'm not going to be the pastor that sweeps it under the rug just because it's a tense or difficult topic i've been praying i've been praying that you would have god reveal a brokenness about you that maybe you haven't addressed i'm going to be praying that god would reveal to you your need to repent repent means to turn away from the way you've been living so that you can live differently with god's help i want to pray for you right now because of this topic god i'm Praying right now, God, that uh, have been this weekend and all week long, that you would have your way across this audience, God, that um, though there's going to be some things that, that cause a, a tension, there's going to be a, 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 a little pushing onto people's hearts, God, I'm praying that their hearts would be open to, 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 be, to, to the revealing, God, that you're doing in their, in their lives, God, that, that the way they've been living is breaking things, it is damaging things, these are not things that... Uh, we can sit around and say it's affecting nobody, it's affecting a lot of people, so God, have your way in our talk and our time together. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
hey, I do think we could have a tendency to think that the topic that I'm talking about is just a small sliver of some of the difficulties we might face in life or a small sliver of the Christian journey. Hey, I come to know Christ, and you know, there's a lot of things that God wants to lead me to better living, and so sexual sin and temptation and winning those battles, that's just a slice of the whole thing. It's a sliver, and, and really it's not. And what I, what I want to bring to your attention is that Typically, people do not experience success in life when they struggle with sexual sin. People that are struggling with sexual addiction, people that are living immorally in, in, in this area in their life, it's usually permeating and affecting other areas of their life, and they're not living successfully either. In fact, I wrote this in your notes. First thing that it, I just wanted to bring to your attention, if you got some notes when you came in, hopefully you did, you can write this down in your notes. Success in life can be directly tied to sexual immorality or sexual morality. In other words, a, there's a more broad, this is not just a small sliver of your life, it is broadly connected to your overall success. Your integrity as a person, your character as a person, is, can be defined in just how you do in this one area of your life it more broadly. I, I think you could probably, there's probably somebody here right now thinking, wait, Jay, are you saying... There are not any immoral, sexual immoral people that are making a lot of money because I know them. They're successful. You, you could say that. Or you could say, Gary, I know people who've got status or power in lofty places, and they live immoral, but yet they're having that kind of success. Well, you could say that to me, and what I would say back to you is you've fallen for the trick of culture that says that's how you define success, by making a lot of money. Uh, by being in a status in some sort of lofty position, you actually think you've bought into the lie that that is what defines success. And I am here to tell you that is not the success that I'm talking about. That is certainly not the success that God is talking about. God's definition of success is very different than what culture and the world says. I thought what, when I talk about how, how this affects success overall in your life, let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. And I wrote this down in my notes. Success is this in, in God's eyes. Celebrating a 25-year or 50-year anniversary and being able to look your spouse in the eye and say, I have been faithful to you this whole time. Folks, that is success in God's eyes. Raising children that when they get older, they understand what sexual purity is. They understand the importance of it. They understand the impact that it has on their life when they don't get it right. Raising kids to be aware of what sexual purity is and living strong enough to be able to win against sexual temptation. Folks, that is success in this world when it comes to God's value of success, the way God sees it. Success is having friends who see your faithfulness, the way you have embraced sexual purity in your life as a win for you, that it's a right thing for you. In fact, they think it's so important, they want to be around you because you ooze with this walk with God and they know that it's happening, that you're the real deal, not just behind the scenes, in public, both places, you are the real deal in both settings and they want to be around you all the time. That is success. Let me tell you what success is. Success is, at the end of life, standing before your heavenly Father and hearing these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want that kind of success. The world's success is temporary. It's fleeting. I want things that matter in life, but instead we've told people, we've told women, hey, you want to find a good man, a successful man? Check the bank account. You don't check to see that he's morally bankrupt. And we, we've allowed that to happen. And so we gotta, we got to understand what success really is and, and what God's desire for success is because this affects all of it when we get this wrong or right. I wrote this down as well. Of course, it's relational. My current and future relationships are deeply affected by success or failure in my sexual purity. They just, they just are. And I know we run around and like to think it's not affecting anybody, but it does. And, and, I, and all the evidences show that it does. And I'm going to share those evidences with you here in just a little bit. But I thought what we would do is spend some time looking at a guy in Scripture who modeled sexual purity and how to do it. Like he, he give, gives us in, in just a handful of passages how to get this right. And, and, and it works today in 2020. Here it is. And so I'm going to give you this text. And, and, and actually, we're going to be looking at a guy in the Scriptures. His name is Joseph. Now, you might have heard of Joseph. Maybe you heard of Joseph and you're thinking of uh, Jesus' stepdaddy, and I'm not talking about that Joseph. That's New Testament Joseph. I'm talking about Old Testament 
Joseph, and his story is, is really, really incredible. It's actually about a 13-year journey where he starts in a very low place. Like, he, he, he goes from the pit and in 13 years to the palace. You know, he goes from the outhouse to the penthouse. But he gets there in a way uh, that, of journeying with God and obedience with God and integrity and morality to his life. And that's how he gets to this place in his life of what could be a God-given, what we know as a God-given success. Uh, Joseph is in Egypt. He is, in essence, uh, on this journey and trusting God, found himself to be in a place where he's something almost like the vice president. And I'm talking about a guy that was in a pit, and now all of a sudden, you know, not all of a sudden, excuse me, over a journey, he is now in this really amazing place that God is trusting him and using him in, in this time. But yet, a moment of temptation comes, and we're going to see how he handles it. I want us to look at this. It's going to be in Genesis chapter 39, and what it's going to give us is four questions that we can ask ourselves when we're dealing with sexual temptation and purity. And here it is in your notes. The first one, I wrote this down, and that is this. A question is, how is my personal walk with God? How is my personal walk with God? Joseph is working hard. He's been journeying with God. God has elevated him because he's trusted God. Joseph has trusted God. And and now he's going to have this place of of temptation. But I want to I want to make it clear how he is going to be able to win this battle. It's found in the very first scripture we're going to look at in Genesis 39 and verse 2. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. I'll just stop right there. That's a key to this thing. He's going to win this battle that's about to happen because the Lord is with him. Can people say that about you right now? Hey, you know what? I, I, just, I just know the Lord is with her. I, I just know by the way they live their life, the Lord is with him. Because that would be a pretty valuable thing for somebody to say, that they just know that they know by the way you live your life, man, the Lord is with you. That's what we see here. The Lord is with, is with Joseph. I got to tell you, like, I want to be that man that somebody could say, the Lord must be with him. I want to be that person. And people can look and they know that it's not just the things on the outside, the things of the inside in my home. That the Lord is with him. Ladies, you... you you want that. You ought to. You ought to be described as the person who's walking with the Lord. Now, how does that happen, though? It's, it, it, again, I, I, I talked about this 13-year incredible journey that Joseph had, and, and it didn't happen overnight. And that's the thing. For you and I to walk with the Lord, it, it is not, uh, you know, you don't encounter the success that we're going to see with Joseph in an overnight setting. It, it's going to happen over. Time And the only way to, 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 to build and to strengthen and to grow over time is to decide that in your life you're going to make daily commitment and investment in your relationship with God. You're here today as a believer. I think so many believers are struggling with this and they're losing their battles against sexual temptation because they are not walking daily with the Lord. And right about now I hear from people and here's what they'll say, well, I ain't got time. Pastor, I just don't have time to invest in my walk with God. These are, the, these are the same people who have plenty of time, like hours on the weekend to watch football games. Now, they don't have time to walk with the Lord, but they have time to watch the game. I'm not being mean with it, but let's just be honest. When we sit here, we're talking about, hey, I don't have time. Let's be honest about what's really, really happening. And these are com- it's coming from women who have a lot of time to scroll on social media or to go shopping, but they don't have time for the Lord. Uh, there are men who say, I, I don't have time for the Lord. you got time to work on your car all week and clean it all up, but, but you don't have time for the Lord. Well, I, don't, I don't have time for the Lord. you got time to get up at 4 a.m. and climb up a tree and get in a deer stand and wait to shoot Bambi, but you don't have time for the Lord. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not being mean with this, but we need to call it what it is. And let me tell you what it is. When we say we don't have time for the Lord, and the truth is we really do, here's what you're doing. You're rejecting God. And, and, uh, again, uh, this is a no condemnation house. I'm trying to bring to your attention what it is we're dealing with and why we're losing these battles. And when you don't spend time with God, you are rejecting time with God. And that's what it is. And it is damaging your ability to win these critical battles in your life. Here's what it says. So he succeeded. Look, he was walking with the Lord. So look, he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of the Egyptian 
master. You don't wake up one day and have that kind of success. Now, you can today invite Jesus Christ into your life and begin that journey. You can be forgiven of your sin today. Your impurity, uh, the mistakes that you've made in any area of your life today, that can happen. You can be forgiven. But to get the strength that I'm talking about, it's this investment that you're making to get stronger and stronger in your journey to be able to reject the temptations that the enemy puts in your path. I wrote this down. When my focus is on God, it's not on impurity. This is not a difficult thing to understand. Like this is not a formula, a math, uh, algebraic equation. You know, here, here it is, ready? It's if I focus on God here, I'm not looking there. So it makes sense that if I would just spend more time here, I'll spend less time there. And I build that and I build that into my life and that strengthening gives me the power to be able to at least turn away from it when it comes into my, into my path. Verse 3, it says this, Potiphar, now this is who, this is who our, our guy Joseph is staying with. He's staying with Potiphar, and it says this, um, he's the kind of like the head of the Egyptian guard, and it says this, Potiphar noticed this, this walking with God. He realized that the Lord was with Joseph, and it was giving him success, it was giving Joseph success in everything that he did. I'm paying attention in this text to the fact that Potiphar just noticed it. Something was oozing out of Joseph in this walk with God. I mentioned like people just know it. It's the vibe. It's the flow. It just it's there. People people know the fruits that are that you're bringing forth in life. It must be because you're walking with God. When you're getting this right, you don't need to run around and tell everybody, "Hey, hey, hey! Today I studied Matthew chapter two." Hey, everybody, I'm going to post online about my study. I'm going to make me a little meme about my incredible bi biblical studies. You don't need to do any of that. If you want to do that, you can, I guess. But I'm saying people know already that you are living this way. It just, it just, comes, it just comes out of you. And that's the case here uh, for Potiphar. He's like, I see it in you, bro. I, I know that you're living this way in your life. And, and this is a portrait of spiritual maturity is what it is. And we talk about that here at our church. We talk about just like when we're born physically, we grow. We were meant to grow. Same thing when we're born spiritually. When you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you, you are to grow. And you ought to mature, and you ought to mature to the point where people say, yeah, they're maturing. I get it. Like with our kids, you know, when they're, when they're born, and you want them to, I want them to stay young. I did. I want my girls, I wanted my girls to stay young, and time is moving so fast. And it, 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 it crushes me sometimes to think about how quickly they're growing up. But, gosh, I can remember, I mean, it was just feels like not long ago they were saying, dad, 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 dad. And like 10 days later, they were going, what's up, dad? You know, and it's like <laughs> shaving their legs now. I'm like, what, what happened? What happened? It's a time, you know, like, where did this go? But it's pretty obvious they, they've, they're maturing, they're growing. It's obvious. It ought to be obvious in your spiritual walk. People should be able to see it. Uh, you're here today, and you're single, and you're looking, you're looking to, to meet somebody. You want to be looking for people that are, it's obvious, single people, single ladies, all the single, la single ladies. You ought to be looking for a man that you know that you know he is walking with the Lord. And I'll just say it like this, ladies. Yeah. Easier to, easy to say, harder to find. You know what I'm talking about, ladies. Right, right, okay. Uh, but here's what I want to say, ladies. If you have to guess as to whether he's walking with the Lord, he ain't. He's not. So I'm saying it's, it's, it's an obvious thing. There's not a question about it. Uh, ladies, when he's walking with the Lord, uh, you know that you don't even have to question. He's going to treat you the way that Jesus would want you to be treated. When he's walking with the Lord, he does not, uh, he's, he's going to commit to you in a way that Jesus would call him to commit to you. Uh, when he's walking with the Lord, he is not going to place his hand in places on you that he should not be placing his hands on you. Uh, so you, you can begin to understand that this is a guy, he is the right guy, he is walking with God. Uh, men, you know, we, men would be looking for hopefully ladies that are walking with the Lord. But here's the thing, men, here's the thing. We carry the bigger burden on this because we should be leading the way. So the, quest, the first question really starts with the men. Hey, hey, how is your walk with the Lord? 
How are you living your life? Here's what it says. I love, I love the portrait of this in verse 4. Here's what it says. So the, the success that Joseph is having, look, this pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph, smart, this is smart, he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for whose sake? Joseph's sake. Guys, here's what I want. Here it is. Ready? I want my house and my family to be blessed for my sake. Okay? Uh, I, I, want, I want to be leading that journey for my home so that my family and my household can be blessed. So we have this thing, men, where we can step up into that role and we can model it. We can, we can be that person that our family can look to. And there's a, there's a blossoming. There's a, there's a power in this for the home, a covering, if you will. It says this, all his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he's loaned. He's like, I want the blessing. I want what you got. I want it in my business. I want it in my home. I want it in everything. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, except, big deal here, what kind of food to eat. Like that, that's all they had to worry about. What kind of food are we going to eat? Now, of course, you might be thinking right now, you might be thinking, well, Gary, <clears throat> does this mean all I have to do is walk with God and I won't have any temptation anymore? No. In fact, it's the opposite. The more you walk with God, the more you're going to discover temptation. Two reasons. Number one, your eyes are open to it now. <coughs> Second reason is this, because the enemy wants to take you down. And the more you're walking with God, the enemy wants to take you down. He wants to take you down. He wants you to be a trophy on his wall. So he is going to be coming after you. But we know, look, you can be close to God and you're going to see temptation. The question is not whether you see it, it's what you do with it. Jesus, obviously close to God. Of course, he is God. He's the son of God. And yet he faced some great temptations. And we talked about that recently here at church. So we know that it can happen. The question is, is are you strengthened enough in your walk with the Lord to be able to deal with it? Here's the next thing that I wrote in my notes. That is this. Do I understand that sexual temptation will happen every day? In order to win a battle, you, you need to understand what you're dealing with. And sometimes we're, not, we're, we're fairly clueless to how this is in front of us all the time. And so I, you've got to come to the realization that it is all around you, 247, media, television, billboards, commercials. Uh, it's everywhere, online. The temptation is there to draw your attention, to lure you into things to look at and, and to see. And grabbing your attention in different ways, sexual temptation is happening every single day. Now, if you don't believe that, it's for one of two reasons. Uh, number one, you, you're living in fairyland because, like, I don't know where you're living, but it's not possible for you to, it seems like, to not know this. Or number two, you're numb to it. Like, the enemy done whooped you so much, you're numb to it. You don't even know it's happening around you. You fall prey to the temptation over and over, and it, it's just numbed you, and you, you've forgotten that it's all around you. You're not paying any attention to it. And when you start walking with God, he can reveal these things to you and say, no, that, that's, un, that's not going to help you. That, that's that's going to damage. That's, that's not going to be good for you. I love what it says in Job 31. It says this in verse 1, and this is something that I've embraced in my life, and so I wanted to share it with you. It says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. He's like, I, I, you know what? No, my eyes, uh-uh, I'm making a covenant. Right? They're not going to. They're not going to go there. They're, they're, my eyes were not made for her. She, she's not my wife, so I, I, it's, not, it's not made for that. And, and I know that um, sometimes people will say, they'll talk about things. They'll say, well, it's just looking. I'm just looking. You know, I'm just looking. And they'll say things like, you know, it's okay to look at the menu. You just don't order off of it. You hear people say things like that. Especially, I've heard married people say this, and they'll say, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, it is causing you, it is causing you, you are being taken to the wrong place, you are being affected by the wrong things, you are, it is impacting your marriage, it absolutely is, you're flirting with it, you're messing with it, you're looking at it, it affects your marriage, those of you who are married, and I want to say this, I, I put a little formula, 
and this is absolutely true, this is like a 100 out of 100 formula. Here it is, I put it in my notes. Anytime you let your eyes wander, it has an equal opposite reaction. It pulls your eyes away from and your desires away from your spouse. It just does. Sometimes it's just little by little, but that energy with your eyes went to her or went to him and, it, and that wasn't your spouse and it was meant for her or him. And you've de-energized your marriage because you've put energy into this. Even if it's just a little bit, it has an opposite reaction every single time. And people mess with this. They, they have this flirtatious relationship with their eyes wandering and they think it's no they think it's no big deal but I liken it to something like riptide in Florida if you know what riptide is along the beach you can have a windy day and and you can look out there and it's a beautiful it's windy beautiful on the beach it looks really nice the waves are a little bit bigger on a day like that and you like it and what you can do is from the shoreline you'll begin to to wander out there just a little bit Ooh, let's just put a toe in it you know let's go out a little bit more and you can't you can't see it coming so you just kind of keep on walking I'm not talking about the current that drifts us that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about riptide. It's like this channel of water that just pulls you straight out fast, out into the ocean. And, and you're, you're just kind of going a little bit further. I'm just looking at her. I'm a little bit further. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in the riptide. And now you're in a really dangerous place. And so little by little, we're taking our, our, our place away from the shoreline, away from our marriage, and we're finding ourselves caught up in things that are damaging. It is a big deal. In verse 6, it says this, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. I think we could all agree this is sexual temptation. Like, she is aggressive, you know? She's going after this guy, and apparently uh, says he's good-looking, he's a good-looking guy, whatever, you know? We don't know what she looked like. We're not really sure. Uh, we don't even know her name. They just call her Potiphar's wife. Uh, apparently, she thought a lot of herself. Sometimes we call her Hotifer, just because we're like, you know, she must really. So she's she's got an interest in this in this guy, and she is making it known. Come, sleep with me. Very clearly, temptation. And Joseph's response now, he's been walking with the Lord. He he's able to identify what's happening, and his response to her is found in the third question. And here it is: Do I understand the consequences of sexual sin? Joseph does. Joseph knows that this reaction is going to cause a reaction. There's going to be dominoes. There's going to be things that happen because of this moment if he gets it wrong. In fact, Joseph knows things about God, and he's been walking with God, and he has the promises of God in him, and so he knows God's design for family, God's design for marriage, and so he's going to, he's going to respond because he understands God's plan. And this is the part where sometimes people who are older say, again, you know, this is for the younger generation, but Gary, we are consenting adults. What is, what is the problem we're consenting adults? Well, these are the words that people say when they, they don't understand God's design or God's promises. They, they don't even believe they're true, that there are consequences when we, when we don't get this right. They think there, are, there are, are no consequences. And I have to tell you, people are like, prove the Bible's true, prove God is real. In the area, this is one area, in the area of sexual sin and sexual temptation, this is an area that all of us can say, I'm standing on the Bible, and this is, a, it's 100% true. A hundred times out of a hundred. I'm going to give you the evidences here in just a second. But it says this in verse 8. But Joseph refused. He said, look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in the entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He held nothing back from me, my, my master, except you, because you are his wife. Joseph says, the reason I'm not going to have anything to do with you is because you ain't my wife. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're somebody else's wife, but you're not my wife. And he understood that there's consequences that come with that when, when you decide to bed down with somebody that's not your spouse. When you watch stuff, when you look at stuff that's revealing that's not your spouse, he's like, I, uh, this is not my spouse. And that is the statement that is so foundational to this because here today in 2020, look, it's still, it, this is still the deal is 
that girl your eyes are following, that, that guy your, your, your eyes are lured to, is not your spouse. Well, Gary, I know, but she's not that person I'm looking at online. That's not, that's not anybody's spouse. What's the big deal? It's somebody's spouse one day. In other words, it, she's not set aside for, he's not set aside for you. You obviously aren't married to him, so they're not yours. So, so what, what, what are you doing? What, 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 are you, what are you looking at? This person was reserved. When, when the clothes come off, like that was reserved for the spouse. This person ain't the spouse. And, and so this becomes a thing in dating. This becomes a thing in, in marriage. This becomes a thing. And when we're, we're looking online, she, he's, he's not your spouse. And, and, and now Joseph says, because I understand that, I understand that if I go that direction with her, there will be, there will be consequences. Joseph is saying, I believe in God's promises about marriage. I believe what God says about marriage. I believe what God says about the family. I believe that this will hurt her. I believe that this will hurt me. I believe that this will hurt my walk with God. And so, because I understand that, I turn away from it. Now, here's the proof. All of us can stand on and know that the Bible was right about this. The Bible says this, that that sex was reserved for marriage. Okay, so then... That means that uh, I would probably need to show that um, there is an unhealthy way uh, that we are bringing upon ourselves when we go outside the bounds of marriage. Fine. Um, yeah, we, a quarter of adults today has STDs. There's some evidence right there that when you don't go God's way, it gets messy. I thought I would show you some pictures of some of the STDs. I'll put them up on the screen. Never mind. I'm just kidding. That's disgusting. We're not going to do that here uh, today. Uh, But there's a psychological hurt. There's a psychological regret. Abortions and abortions that are kept secret, but there's a brokenness associated with those, uh, the secrets that we try to keep, the secrets that we're hiding, uh, the broken marriages, the broken kids. All these things are not of God, and they're permeating our culture for one simple reason. We we didn't trust God on this. We thought he was full of it. We didn't think that it would, the very best was for the bounds of marriage. And so we, we just thought we would do it, on our, do it our way. I put some of, more of them on the screen. Some of them I've already shared, but we'll put them up on the screen. Uh, the, sex outside of marriage leads to ad- adultery. Uh, fatherless children, abandoned children, abortion, sexual abuse, pornography, sex slave trade, a brokenness that can lead to, to some mental illness. And when I, when I talk about mental illness in this context, I have met with people who have something like a PTSD related to post previous sexual encounters. And they, they, they go into sort of a, a mental spiral related to this area of their life. So I know it's real. It happens. Uh, teen pregnancy, financial ruin, lack of intimacy in the marriage is a product of us stepping out of bounds. And, and that is just simply this, lack of intimacy in the marriage is... You know, you step out, whether you watch online or, or with looking at women or in physical relationships or emotional or, or with men, and, and you can't be trusted. And when there's no trust, intimacy fades. And so that happens as well. All these things are the proof that you and I can stand on and say, see, hey, God was right. Now, of course, there's always somebody who pushes back and says, oh, man, it's all about rules. That's what you're talking about, rules, religion, religion, rules. I'm actually not talking about that. I'm talking about freedom from having to live that way any longer. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about freedom. Uh, When I follow Jesus Christ, when you follow God's plan for purity, marriages are saved. Families are kept together. Abortions end. STDs can be stopped. The hurt of broken relationships can be stopped. The sneaking around, the hiding behind the scenes so that nobody knows, and all the exhaustion and hiding, it begins to stop. That is freedom in my book. You can call it rules if you want, but I call it freedom, a freedom that I've discovered in my own life. This lifestyle that God has to offer all people, it, it, it's real. The evidence backs it up. I hear some people, they'll say things like, well, porn, you know, porn's not a big deal. You know, I, I hear people say this about pornography. And I just wanted to share some things with you real quick about pornography because I know it's rampant with men, but also women now. Here's what I wrote. Porn is addictive. It sends the same dopamines as cocaine in your brain. Porn is an affair. That person on the screen is is not your your spouse. Uh, Porn is sex slave trade. Uh, Some of these girls are working for almost nothing, and they have something like a pimp-like leadership over them. 
and you're just perpetuating it when you watch it. Gary, it's free. Oh, there's money flowing. And every time you watch it, you help it. Porn is somebody's daughter. You got daughters? That's somebody's daughter. Uh, Porn puts your wife or your spouse in an unfair place because now they have to perform to some sort of fantasy. That's, That's all it is, is a fantasy. And, and, he, and, and we're just perpetuating this because we think it's no big deal. And then our kids see it, and they're getting hooked on it. And, and, they, and, and, and they pass it on. And it's like this infection that gets passed on and passed on. It's so hard to break. Really, it's no big deal? I, I hear sometimes men will say this especially. They'll talk about how it's no big deal. And usually it's just to kind of justify it. But most men, they discovered pornography from their fathers or somebody close to them. You know, another guy sometimes, but oftentimes it's a, a, it's a masculine sort of adult figure that they found the magazines or they found the tapes and they started watching it when they were young and now they do it. And you know what? There was a day when you discovered this from your father that you discovered your father was a pervert. And that's hard, you know, to come to grips with. And now you watch it and you're a pervert as well. And I'm, I'm just, let's just call it what it is. You're, you're watching little girls. Ladies, you're, you're watching them. And you could be mad for me calling it out, but I think we got, we got to deal with this front and center because it's hurting families. And if you're mad that I'm calling you a pervert, I'll be out here. You can come beat me up later if you want. Or, or what you can decide to do is get your life right and save your family and save your marriage and save your relationships and make a turn and make a turn here today. This is a no condemnation house. I don't want you to walk out of here with your head low. I want you to let Jesus Christ lift your head high because you have decided to live a life that is going to be different going forward. There's some men here in this room that you are causing your wife to live in some fantasy land and it is burned into you. It is burned into you. You can't stop it. There are women here and you think this is what is what men have to have. And so you know what you do, some of you ladies? You, you pass pictures around of yourself. You do this. It's highly not smart, just for a thousand reasons. But uh, you, you dress a certain way, to, to skin to try to get attention. A couple things about that. First of all, you're making a declaration of your inability to come to terms with your God-given identity. What you think is the best identity you have in your life is when a man is looking at you. And I want to say to you, ma'am, The best identity you really could chase after in your life is the way your Heavenly Father sees you. And when you understand how your Heavenly Father sees you, you don't need to dress a certain way to get the attention of a man. And let me also say this, if you are dating a guy and you got his attention by the way you dress, you can be sure he's looking at other women by the way they dress. He was not looking at you for your insides, and he's looking at other women as well the same way. Look, God wants the church to be full of men and women who can do incredible things and be an example for their community. God wants the church to be able to be ready to storm the gates of hell, but we can't charge the gates of hell with our pants around our ankles. We just can't. Oral sex is another thing. I hear people say, well, it's just oral sex. It's not really sex. It's called oral sex sex. Don't come at me and tell me just because it's called fried chicken, it's not chicken. It's still chicken. You call it fried, baked, whatever you want, it's still chicken. <laughs> uh, there are consequences not just in your relationships, but also, of course, in your relationship with God. I wrote this down. You cannot have sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend and go have a good Bible study. You can't. You can't be addicted to porn and come here and worship God in a healthy way. You can't have an affair and follow Jesus the way that you need to follow Jesus. Here's the last thing I put in your notes. Are you willing to run? Are you willing to flee? Are you willing to run? That's the last question. Because this is what people who are journeying with God do. They flee from it. They run from it. Verse 10 says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. But he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. He's like, I am getting out of here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. 
Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So honor your God with your body. Honor God with your body. Are you honoring God with your body? Look, Jesus Christ did not go and die on the cross so that we could sleep around, pass diseases, damage men, women, and children, have babies out of wedlock, live in regret, and wreck our marriages. He died on the cross for the complete opposite, so that we could be forgiven, have freedom, so that we could advance forward and live better in our lives, and of course, for eternal salvation. Guys, we have to understand how important this is. Verse 11, it says this, and I'll finish up. One day, however, no one else was around. And when he went in to do his work, now here she comes again. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away from her, but left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. So I'm out of here. And, and that's the decision that you've got to make if you're going to get this right. Is It's not one you can play around with. It's not one you can tour. You've got to decide to get serious about it. And on this journey, walking with the Lord day after day, you begin to see these results play out. Now, maybe you're here today and there's been some conviction and it's bothered you a little bit. And I told you, hey, you can leave here with your head held high. There was a woman that came to Jesus who had been sinning. Uh, it was, she had not been living pure. And they, in fact, they brought this woman before Jesus to kind of stone her to death. Maybe you know about this. And they were going to stone her to death. And then Jesus said, hey, if, if you know, he who has not sinned, feel free to cast the first stone. And they all dropped their stones and walked away. And Jesus says in this portrait of what I want to say to you after all the things I've shared, he said, look, your sins are forgiven, but look, 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 look. go and sin no more. Your sin can be forgiven today, but go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. You, you have to, in order to win that battle, uh, be involved in a day after day investment with God. I want to pray for you now. Would you bow your heads? Father, for the believer in the room, and God, they can be made pure and right. To, uh, they've fallen short on this. They, they've missed it, but they can be forgiven today, right now, from where they're seated. Watching online, you can be forgiven. You do not have to live this way. You can be forgiven, set free, but you have to decide. And I'm praying, God, the power of your Holy Spirit would convict and cause people to want to get into you, to get into your word, to, start, to, to, to journey with you, to walk with you, God. It won't happen overnight. We can begin that journey today of walking deeply with you, this area of our life, God, so we can win these battles. I'm praying for the unbeliever here in the room right now. And in a room this size, we have many people here who would say, you know what, I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. So you can, you can today and you can find freedom. You, you do not have to live in the back alleys of this world any longer. Uh, you do not have to live in the dark places of this world and hiding from things and suppressing and trying to not get found out or through addictions or struggle you can turn to God today right now and the Bible says that any of us can be forgiven if we accept the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross Jesus comes blood is shed on the cross for your sin so that you may be forgiven pure blood sacrifice but for all who believe in the name of Jesus Christ they can be saved that Jesus is the way the truth and the life that anybody can come to the Father if they've been forgiven. And you can receive that today. God, I am ready to journey with you. I, am, I receive the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of your one and only Son. I am ready to confess Him as Lord and Savior today. I invite you in, God. Forgive me. Make me new. Let me begin today to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm going to hand things over to Pastor Joe. Yeah. What a great message by Pastor Gary. And, and you know, a couple of things about that message. First of all, if you're going to stand up on a stage and deliver a message 
on living with high integrity and high character based on a foundation of the righteousness of Christ, let me tell you something. You better be living in that space. And, and, and when, when people ask me about Pastor Gary, and they're like, what's he really like? You know what like the first three words that come to my mind are? Uh, integrity, character, and righteousness. These are good things for you to know about your pastor, for sure. Yeah, we should clap for him. For, it's well-deserved. Here's the other thing. If we are not living in accordance to those wise, wise words that he just shared with us, we're fighting a losing battle. We're, we're, we're fighting a war that's already lost. But the good news is it, it's not too late. We can turn to Christ and have him work with us to work through this. A good week to take some time for self-examination. Oh, we're going to move now to a, a different part of our service where we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Right now, I'm going to transition us by praying for those, and then our ushers are going to come, and they're going to help with the offering. But let's pray together. Lord God, you are a good God, and we love you. Father, you have a high bar. You have high expectations for us. So Lord, help us to remember that you also equip us well. Through your word, you help us. Through your spirit, you convict us. Father, thank you for when we chose to follow you, you imparted your righteousness to us. Help us never to forget that as we fight these battles. Lord, we also bring to you today our tithes and our offerings. We ask that you bless them, that you take them, that you use them, Lord, to grow your kingdom and make your name famous. We ask this through Jesus. Amen. Well, our ushers are going to come now. Will they do? There's a couple of things I was hoping to do. One thing I need your help with, which is to welcome our VIPs. Can you help me welcome our VIPs, New Walk? First and second time guests, we are so excited you are here with us today. Here's what we'd encourage you to do when we're done here. As you go out, there's a blue awning. There's some folks in there who are going to be super excited to see you. They want to give you a gift. They'd love to talk to you about the church. One way to make a big church like this feel smaller is to start maybe talking to folks and asking people questions. So take some time today and definitely do that. The next thing I want to mention to you is if you are a parent of middle school or high schoolers, if you are a middle schooler or high schooler, or if you know a middle schooler or high school, that's pretty much everybody in the room. Here, let me encourage you. Get them to Amped on Wednesday nights. We're in a new series on Wednesday called Tribe. Hey, you all know Pastor Rusty, our new pastor. Have you met Pastor Rusty yet? Yeah, we definitely should clap for Pastor Rusty. He is doing a great job, and the series that he has our students in is a can't-miss series. So if they're not getting here on Wednesdays, man, they're missing out. Definitely get them here. And, and for you parents, on March 4th, at, uh, Wednesday night at AMP, we're going to have Parents' Night. During that night, Pastor Rusty is actually bringing in a counselor who's going to help talk to us parents about how to help our kids with anxiety and depression. These are important things to get. So you'll get to come in that night, experience worship with the kids. Worship is awesome on Wednesdays. It's just like this. It's pretty much the same people. And then we'll all go into another room with Pastor Rusty and get a great teaching while our kids stay in here and get a great teaching. Definitely don't want to miss any of that. Well, guys, I know this was maybe a tough message today. So if, if you've got something going on that you want to pray about, that you want to talk some, with someone about, whether it's about the message or not, let everyone go from this crowded room. Come on down here. The pastoral care team will be down here. We'd love to pray with you right now. For everyone else, we love you guys. You have a great week. Good guitar player. He's one of the best.